Since it's St. David's Day and I'm a Welshman, I thought it appropriate to make this video looking at the economy of Wales. At the moment, the employment rate of 24.2% is its highest in history, and the unemployment rate of 4.3% is quite low. However, the poverty rate is 23%, and one in seven people are still on benefits, and this leads us to a central question that anyone looking honestly at the Welsh economy must ask. Why is Wales so poor? The GDP per capita of Wales is around £19,000, which is 58% of the EU average. And in truth, this relative poverty has been true for most of Wales's history. For hundreds of years, it was a sparsely populated rural area with difficult terrain. Its ports into the Bristol Channel are arguably less strategically useful than those which open into the Irish Sea, the English Channel, or the North Sea. That changed, of course, in the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution, when coal became a very important resource, especially in South Wales. If we look at the data from the 1850s to 1908, output of coal from the South Wales pits increased by 569.3%, and the population grew by 196.55%, from 232,000 to 688,000. However, during this period, the labor movement had begun in earnest and there was a dramatic increase in strike action. In fact, mining had been one of the first industries to unionize, leading to a slew of government interventions in the industry throughout the 19th century, which I discuss in some detail in my video, Won't Someone Think of the Children? If you're interested, I'd recommend stopping this now and watching that and then coming back. But the upshot, as I argue there, is that decades of union agitation had led to an unholy trinity of union bosses, politicians and mine owners in settling these disputes by government legislation. One direct consequence of this is that the owners never modernised their equipment for fear of job losses. Some miners were still using pickaxes as late as the 1960s. As the situation in the United States shows, nothing about this was inevitable. Another direct consequence was massive protectionism for the coal industry from about 1900s onwards. This did nothing to stave off endemic strikes, but simply incentivized them further. In 1926, the UK government, now more or less directly in control of the coal industry, tried to reduce the wages of around 1.2 million coal miners, which were already well above market rates. This produced over 162 million lost working days through industrial action. This strike is still romanticised by Labour supporters as a remarkable show of solidarity, but its only real consequence was to reduce raw output. If we return to the data, we can see a 29.7% decrease in coal production in South Wales from 1908 to 1938. Furthermore, artificially inflated workers' wages set by government edict after numerous strikes had led to a 40% unemployment rate by the mid-1930s. I wonder how many trade unionists realised at the time that they practically killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. Going back to the numbers, we can see that even as coal output decreased, the population of South Wales, which remember had swelled entirely because of coal mining in the first place, did not decrease even as unemployment hit 40%. And then, after the Second World War, Clement Attlee came to power, and this had two big consequences for Wales. First, he nationalised the coal mines, which meant that they were now officially being controlled centrally by the UK government after having been unofficially run by them through various interventions since at least the 1910s. And second, since the workers represented such a huge chunk of the electorate, there was now a whole new attitude in the political classes of indulging each and every whim of the unions. This was common to both Labour and the Tory party during the so-called post-war consensus. We can see how each successive government caved into strike action by looking at the total number of industrial disputes which skyrocketed after 1945 
and the comparatively smaller number of working days lost to strikes. In lay terms, this means the government was simply caving in each and every time. And we can see very easily the results of this by looking at the miners' wages, which rose by 107% from 1948 to 1978, despite a 41% drop in total demand for coal in the same period. Now, can anyone see the problem here? Falling demand, rising wages, and drastically lower productivity. If we look at the unemployment statistics again, they mask a horrible reality. That 40% unemployment rate in the 1930s, look at it again. Had the Welsh coal industry really recovered to such an extent that after the war, over 400,000 jobs had come back to the area? I mean, it's possible that the government was using their new control over the industry as a form of mass welfare. A nationwide Keynesian make-work scheme to con people into believing, quote, they've never had it quite so good. You can judge that for yourselves, but one thing from this data is absolutely certain. The Welsh coal industry, in real terms, was deader than a dodo long before Margaret Thatcher stepped into Downing Street. That she is still blamed today for the death of mining is a gross injustice. Furthermore, many blame Thatcher for not finding new jobs for all those workers who were displaced when the mines closed. But it is simply not the government's role to find work for people. And the blame for conditioning a generation or two of Welsh people for believing that they should is to be squarely placed on those who maintained the illusion that they were providing them jobs in the first place. The Welsh economy from 1948 to 1978 was an entirely false economy. Now, for some viewers, this will be a bitter realisation, but the data doesn't lie. Perhaps the worst legacy of this false economy is that it led to a posture of victimhood and helplessness in Wales. The Welsh still, even today, some 40 years after the facade was exposed, bemoan the fact that the coal mines were not replaced by anything. But surely it is not up to Westminster to replace industry. It is up to the Welsh people to develop their own industry, to innovate, to attract investment, to compete in business, to create jobs which the economy properly lost in the 1930s. As we have seen, not the 1980s, not even the 1970s, the 1930s. Unfortunately, most in Wales have yet to learn this lesson. Every year, Wales takes out £15 billion in tax revenue, more than it pays in. That means the average person living in Wales represents a £2,026 cost to the UK economy as a whole. Where does this money come from? Well, from these figures, one can see quite clearly that it comes from London directly, which, through this chain of socialism, keeps Wales locked in vassalage, stealing its best talent while keeping the population in poverty, feeding from the so-called benevolent hand of benefits. And as long as this remains the case, Wales will revert to type as a poor and relatively obscure backwater to England. Happy St. David's Day. Now get out.